Okay, I believe we are ready to proceed, Chair Massey. Okay, I believe we are ready to proceed, Chair Massey. One moment, Chair Massey, let's let, let's let, let you uh, speak. Okay, you can't expect me to speak if you mute me. <laughs> no, sir, would never dream of it. <laughs> we need some sign language to... Uh... Um. Good afternoon, the May 7th, 2020, regular board meeting of the City Colleges of Chicago is now called to order. I would like to remind everyone that the state of Illinois continues to operate under a statewide disaster proclamation, first issued by Governor Pritzker on March 9th and reconfirmed through Executive Order 2020-32, which was issued on April 30th, 2020. Previously on March 16, 2020, Governor Pritzker signed Executive Order 2020-07, which among other things prohibited gatherings of a certain size and suspended certain portions of the Illinois Open Meetings Act, 5 ILCS 120, which requires in-person attendance by members of a public body during the period of such disaster declarations related to the COVID-19 pandemic. To that end, we meet today virtually to undertake certain actions necessary for the continued efficient operation of the district. Will the Assistant Secretary please call the roll? Vice Chair Swanson. She's muted. I am unmuted. Vice Chair Swanson. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Secretary Davis. Present. Trustee Kent. Here. Trustee Talman. Present. Trustee Williams. Present. Student Trustee Thomas. Present. Chair Massey. Here. Let the record show that in accordance with the Illinois Public Community College Act and the Illinois Open Meetings Act, we have a quorum. So thank you all. This is a second time we've tried this and it worked fairly well the last time. So we'll see how it goes today. Thank you all for taking the time to participate. And any audience that is viewing us, thank you for tuning in. This is a month of transitions for city colleges. To our graduating students, who would have walked across the stage at the Wind Trust Arena last weekend, we again wish you well as you complete any last exams and as you prepare to move into the workforce or to the next phase of your education. As we continue in this theme of transitions, I'd like to welcome Professor Keith Spruer to today's meeting. Professor Spruer is a member of the English faculty at Truman College. Uh, he's known to many of you for his long service and active participation on the faculty council. Professor Spruer joins us as faculty council president and on behalf of my colleagues on the board today, I would like to welcome him to our meeting and we look forward to having him in person in the future at our meeting. I would also like to welcome our new student trustee, James Thomas. He is a student at Olive Harvey College. He was elected by the student body of Olive Harvey on behalf of all the students across the district. And we are delighted to have him join us for his official duties representing all of the 70,000 plus students across the city colleges system. No pressure, James. But uh, you have presented to the board before, so you're not a complete stranger. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Spruer also has presented on several occasions, and you've heard both of them present thoughtful remarks uh, at our public comment sessions. So we look forward to having the 
benefit of your former participation on a regular basis. But to allow for student trustee Thomas to fully participate in today's proceedings, uh, with the leave of the body, I'd like to entertain a motion to consider resolution 1.01 out of order for the purposes of formally appointing Mr. Thomas as our student trustee. Will the chief advisor please describe the resolution? Trustees, resolution 1.01 .01 appoints student member to the board of trustees, uh, in this case, uh, Mr. Thomas, who will be joining the trustee board for a period ending April 14, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, trustees. If there are no questions, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Second. We don't need a roll call, right? I should, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Congratulations. Let the record show that mm -hmm. resolution 1.01 .01 has been approved. Welcome on board. Yeah, Thank you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Perhaps you'd like to say a few words. Oh, actually I do. Thank you. I appreciate it, Chair Massey. Um, I look forward to working with the board and the trustees. I will serve the students of all the seven colleges well. I will do my part and, you know, get the job done, whatever is necessary, and it's all for the betterment of the students and the betterment of the, of the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I must say, since I've been on the board, we've had a remarkable group of student trustees. I mean, absolutely outstanding. I don't say that to put more pressure, on, <laughs> but to, I'm sure you're going to meet, meet that standard. You know, there's, there's some, also always some controversy in some organizations about having students on the board of trustees, but all of our trustees, I think have just been so marvelous, great contributors and have added so much. And I'm sure you will do the same. Welcome. Uh, I'm sure uh, you will make Professor, President Hollingsworth and all of our students proud over the next years that you're on the, uh, on the board. So now we'll go to Chancellor Salgado for his report. Thank you, uh, Chair Massey, uh, trustees. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm going to start by welcoming the new faculty council president, uh, Keith Spurur, and also thanking outgoing president, uh, Adriana Tapanes Hinojosa. Uh, when you serve as a faculty council president, it's uh, like any other leadership position, it comes with extra responsibility, um, extra duties, and extra care. And I deeply appreciate um, all of uh, the leadership, including uh, faculty council presidents um, that have served during my term as um, chancellor. Um, I also wanna welcome our new student trustee, uh, James Thomas of Olive Harvey. I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting with James, working with James, even having um, a very important dinner with James. And uh, I think uh, and know that you will fall in the strong history of you know, student trustees that we've had um, serving here at City Colleges of Chicago, as Chair Massey has said, but also thank Armani Alexander for his contributions um, to the board um, over the last year as well. Um, this is finals week at CCC. Uh, we want to send uh, good thoughts to all of our students who are finishing up their last uh, tests, projects, uh, papers. Uh, you know, it sounds good, right? It sounds great actually um, to say that. Um, I, uh, I, I wanna you know, share how proud I am, how proud the entire team is of all our students who have worked very hard every day through this once in a lifetime pandemic to persist and complete their courses um, this semester. It's a major accomplishment when you think of what adjustments those students have had to make and challenges um, that they faced and to get to this finish line um, is special. And we certainly recognize it at City Colleges. Um, you know, we, we wanna congratulate because you know, this week uh, our completers will be earning their degrees this year. Uh, so congratulations to the class of 2020. Um, we are looking forward to celebrating your achievements at a virtual, virtual ceremony that will be available online starting uh, June 27th. Uh, but we're also making sure that 
our students have the ability to choose to take part in next year's in-person ceremony. Um, or maybe they want to do both, right? <laughs> do the virtual one now and do in-person um, next year. Uh, what we want to make sure is that your success um, is celebrated, your accomplishment is celebrated. Um, you know, and I want to make sure to continue to reiterate the commitment that we have to student success. Uh, and I think we've lived that commitment, you know, over the last few um, weeks uh, in, in terms of the transition to remote learning. Uh, the adoption of uh, this mode of instruction and the bringing the normalcy uh, to, to the learning process. And so the distribution of the laptops and the Wi-Fi that we loaned out to students, um, you know, this was and continues to be part of our uh, ongoing commitment to support you, our students, in every way possible. I want to make sure I also update uh, the Board of Trustees and the public at large as it, re as it relates to the CARES Act. Um, as you know, uh, you may know, City Colleges of Chicago um, will be receiving uh, over $25 million through the CARE Act, CARES Act. This resource comes in two portions. There is an institutional portion that is half of that, and there is a portion that goes directly to students for their emergency needs. As it relates to the institutional portion, we have yet to receive the institutional portion. We have also yet to receive critical guidance from the US Department of Education on critical questions that we have regarding the institutional portion. We hope to receive that in the coming days. We hope to receive the resources um, so that we can do the proper planning. But as it relates to the $12.7 million for direct assistance to eligible credit, seeking, credit degree seeking students, um, I want you to know that we are moving those funds out to students in a pretty quick uh, fashion. And in spite of the evolving guidance from the US Department of Education, we are working to get these funds in the hands of students. Roughly 60% of City Colleges CARES Act direct aid funds uh, will be dispersed based on headcount to students deemed eligible by the US Department of Educational Guidelines up to $350 per student. And roughly 40% of CARES Act funds will be distributed to students experiencing homelessness, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, these kinds of challenges. Our students are hardworking and resilient, but many of them needed housing, food, and financial support before the COVID-19 crisis. And this pandemic has only exacerbated that need. I'm also proud to say that the foundation, the CCC Foundation, has raised additional private funds for our students, for the Chancellor's Retention Fund, which provides tuition support to allow students to stay enrolled and on their path to completion, but also for the COVID-19 Student Emergency Fund so that we can help a broader range of students than those that the US Department of Education allows us to assist. I wanna thank those who have contributed, including the Soro Funds at the Chicago Community Trust um, in their support for the Chancellor's Retention Fund. And uh, thank you to donors to the COVID-19 Student Emergency Fund, which include, among others, Bank of America, Cindy Molis, who sits on the foundation board, and our very own Walter and Shirley Massey. We thank you so much for your contributions. Um, members of our community can learn more about the ways we are dispersing CARE Act funds and the progress of disbursements online at our finance website at www.ccc.edu backslash finance. Again, www.ccc.edu backslash finance. We will update the public on the utilization and progress we are making 
in the utilization of the CARES Act. Um, we know we're living in unprecedented times. I continue to be impressed, incredibly impressed with the way our students, faculty, staff have responded to this challenge and are working together to ensure our students can reach their goals. I wanna especially recognize those essential employees that are making sure our facilities can still operate and will be ready when we return. I want you to know we have disposable masks for these employees to wear and cloth masks have recently arrived that we'll be distributing to essential employees reporting to work in the coming weeks. I wanna thank the administrative services team for ensuring that our essential workers have plenty of places uh, not just to wash their hands regularly, but hand sanitizer wipes, all the things that you would want. And additionally, um, ensuring that we are practicing social distancing measures within our campuses um, as we speak. We continue also to adapt to life remotely. We held uh, our first ever virtual college exploration week last week, which attracted more than 1,000 registrants with student and staff for more than 100 CPS schools to learn about City College's academic programs, scholarships, and admissions. I want to thank Dr. Sean Jackson for his vision for this event and all the team members who came together quickly to pull it off. We look forward to hosting more of these virtual exploration events in the coming months. This is a platform for us to build upon. Um, we know there's going to come a time when this uh, crisis uh, begins to subside and life begins to come back to normal, albeit as our governor has stated and our mayor has stated in stages. Um, when we come out of our stay at home order, our first priority will be to ensure students who had courses put on pause during the spring can complete. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, before I close, Chair Massey, I just want to reiterate the tremendous support that we have received um, from the Board of Trustees as well. Uh, your diligence, uh, Vice Chair Swanson's diligence, the regular calls that we have to keep you informed uh, and therefore keep the rest of the board informed have been incredibly useful to me and to our leadership um, team. And finally, uh, registration is open for summer and fall classes. Uh, and so uh, now's the time uh, to register so you can continue on your education. And that, with that, that concludes my remarks. Okay, uh, thank you, Juan, for that complete report. I have a, a question. It says, make sure I understand. So we have $12 million going to students. Of that 12, half of that, approximately six, no, you're shaking your head, is going to directly to students. Is that, okay, say it again, because it confuses me each time. Unmute them. Uh, oh, no, I got it now. No, Chair Massey, um, the funds are divided in two, um, but we 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 only receive the entire twelve point seven million for students. Right. Okay. So we are deploying that entire twelve point seven million. We don't have uh, these come in two separate uh, allotments. Okay? Right. So. We have received the complete 12.7 million that must go to students. Okay. And we have yet to receive a single dollar of that money that could come to the institution. Okay, let me ask it another way. You're gonna you said you're gonna contribute $350 up to up to $350 per student directly. How much of the funds is that? Oh, okay, different question, right? Um, That's not the entire 12 million. 
No, uh, it's it's I, I, I'm sorry, Chair Massey, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's close to eight million dollars, seven point um, something. OK, close to eight million dollars will be distributed based on a headcount basis to students and then uh, a little bit more than four million will be distributed uh, to students based on other needs uh, that they may have, more intensive needs. So the, 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 the division is roughly 60%, you know, of the 12.7 million going on a headcount basis and 40% going on a, a more intensive need basis. Right. So how did we arrive at 350? We looked at, um, we, we looked at several factors, Chair Massey. Um, first of all, uh, the allocations are made uh, to the colleges and it was important to us that all students at all colleges receive um, the same amount on a headcount basis. We did not want to favor uh, a full-time student over a part-time student. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we treated, you know, all of our credit degree seeking students um, equally. Uh, and when you looked at the allocations per college and our desire to reserve at the minimum for each college, roughly 30% for the needs-based portion, uh, it, it left us with the ability to, um, uh, to distribute the 350 per student consistently across all seven campuses. What that means is that some colleges actually have a greater percentage of need-based funds. So if you look at a college like Kennedy King, Kennedy King will have nearly 50% of their funds that they will be able to distribute on a needs basis, whereas another college may only have 30%. We are posting the specific percentages um, per college, right, that would be going to um, the headcount and the need based to our CCC finance website so that any member of the public can see how this distribution is actually working. Additionally, Chair Massey, we will be posting regular updates so that the public can see how much of the dollars have actually been accessed by students uh, you know, as of today, and we will continue to update that um, regularly as there are significant movements in the utilization of those funds. Uh, but to recap, Chair Massey, we wanted the same amount for all students, number one, and we wanted each college to have at the minimum roughly about 30% left in order to do needs-based funds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does any other trustee have a question? Um, Chancellor, can you just explain mm -hmm. how the other 40% will be distributed? Yes. Um, much of the distribution will be using very similar mechanisms uh, to what we use to distribute the $350 um, to students. Uh, you know, we have a, a form. Number one is students have to meet the eligibility requirements for CARE Act uh, fund distribution, uh, which means they have to um, have a FAFSA on file for this year or the coming year, uh, the, 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 the coming year's um, FAFSA, uh, or uh, they have to, if they don't have that, we are asking them to put in a FAFSA application, which takes about an hour and it takes about three days for us to hear back from uh, the federal government that they in fact submitted a FAFSA. That ensures us that uh, a student is in fact eligible for uh, the CARE Act funds. Um, once we've established the eligibility, that student receives a form um, where they are able to articulate and attest to the needs that um, they have, whether it's housing, food, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and other matters that 
were caused by the disruption that COVID created. This is important detail, uh, Trustee Tillman, that the students that are included are the students that were on our roster, eligible students on our roster on the day that the national emergency was declared, which was March 13th. Um, if they were not on our roster on that date, they're actually not eligible. Eligibility start date is that particular day. Um, and so they signed the attestation. At that point, the only other thing they have to do is give us um, uh, you know, our ability to drop the money into an account. Uh, and that's the easiest way for them to gain access to the funds. Uh, and if they do not do that, um, then after some time, we actually end up sending them a paper check. Um, this is uh, using our existing internal system uh, that we use to post financial aid dollars into students' accounts. Um, and so this has been vetted by our general counsel um, and our CFO uh, to make sure that we are operating in accordance with um, uh, the CARES Act and as well uh, guidance from USDOE. Uh, Chancellor, I guess I, my question is that you said they had to submit a FAFSA, but anybody can, can submit a FAFSA, right? Is there income eligibilities that they have to meet or? No, no, um, no. They, they To be eligible for the CARES Act, you simply have to be eligible to submit a FAFSA. So we could potentially have uh, students who have cash or have money available getting access to this? Yes. What do you mean cash or money available? I guess that I submitted a FAFSA and I wasn't, I didn't receive any loans or any grants for my, my kids when they went to school, but I certainly submitted a FAFSA to see what was available. So I guess I'm asking if, if could there be somebody who, you know, has excess family money and still have access to this, the CARES Act? There, there, there could in fact be, um, yes. Hmm. Yep. Okay. That's yeah, and that's the way it was set up, and that's why we established a uh, a product. That's why we've 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 created a both a head count and a need based um, component uh, to this uh, okay. funding allocation. Only those people who uh, would get the three fifty could fall in that category. Right, the rest of the forty percent is need based. Is That's that, correct, Chair Massey. Uh, it's just yeah, they no people you're speaking of, uh, uh, they they could possibly get three hundred and fifty dollars because everybody. Uh -huh. That's uh, that's unfortunate because obviously that was a problem with the paycheck protection um, program that there were a lot of companies who applied and really didn't really need it. So um, it's. You know, it's unfortunate to hear that we could potentially have that as well, based yeah. on the criteria set by the government. But I suspect our demographics are such that, even though that might happen, mm -hmm. it's going to be small compared to the University of Chicago. It's going to be very, very small. And I think one thing to you know keep in mind is when you think about financial aid, um, actually eligibility that is getting financial aid, um, you know, you, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong generally on this, Mark, but for a family of five, um, it's roughly the threshold is $55,000. Um, you know, so if you're at $55,000 and, you know, and you know, $60,000, let's just say, your likelihood of actually getting financial aid is not very high. And yet we have lots of students that are on that threshold. And so, you know, this is something we discussed with our presidents. Um, we discussed quite a bit internally. You know, we really felt that given our demographics, um, it was important that we go out and we give everybody, the, uh, everybody that's eligible the opportunity to get a portion, okay? Um, and that we then set up a needs-based fund so that we can uh, distribute uh, the rest of it 
on again on on a, a, a more needs basis. Um, Mark, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on that. I think I think I, we I, probably given the time, unless another trustee has a question, you probably ought to move on. So thank you, the Chancellor. That ends your report. Yes. Okay, sorry, Mark. So it's now time for public participation. And there are four requests for public participation today. And I will note that a clock will appear on your screen for those of you who are getting the presentation to show you when your two minutes have expired. At that point, if you have not concluded your remarks, you will be asked once to bring your remarks to a close and then we will proceed with our agenda. We appreciate your understanding and assistance. I will also note that while we are not having a district update this month, uh, Provost Potter has prepared a presentation and explanatory uh, video on the topic of enrollment, which has been posted on the event page for today's meeting, which is www.ccc.edu. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see it. I saw it, Mark, I think it's very good. We should, we should do this kind of thing more often, <laughs> you know, even when we're not in lockdown mode. I think we're learning something, a lot about communicating you know, in other ways. So thank you for doing that. Will the Assistant Secretary please proceed? Thank you, Chair Massey. Um, this month, we actually have three speakers. One uh, registered speaker withdrew their remarks. Um, so our three registered public speakers are Randy Miller, Sonia Flores, Kimberly Taylor. So for our public speakers, we will now call you one by one. If you're following today's proceedings online, we'd ask that you would mute your computer audio at this time. In the upper uh, left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see that there is a clock. And as the clock approaches one minute, please plan to bring your remarks to a close. So we will begin with Randy Miller. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, college presidents, members of the board, Trustee Thomas and Chancellor Salgado. My name is Randy Miller, and I represent the City College's 1,000 adjunct professors, part-time librarians, and vocational lecturers at pres as president of CLOCK. First, I'd like to report on the heroic and inspiring efforts of City College's adjunct faculty and part-time librarians in converting their classes and their work to remote delivery. Despite monumental challenges, in one week's time, adjuncts learned unfamiliar technologies, adapted lessons, and did as much as humanly possible to shepherd our students through this jarring transition. It is truly astounding what these educators have accomplished and continue to do to serve our students. The board should be just as proud as I am of the extraordinary work of these dedicated educators. Unfortunately, financial uh, uncertainty and uh, financial instability are not new to adjuncts. We're the most vulnerable population of educators at city colleges and have been so long before the current crisis. In the last two years, 25% of our members have been forced to use public assistance. Nearly 90% of those using public aid did so for healthcare needs. One in eight adjunct educators at city colleges in Chicago are food insecure. That was before the pandemic and it's not an accident. It's a result of policy decisions that need to change immediately as adjuncts continue to bargain for a new contract. I'm calling on city colleges to provide direct financial resources to their most vulnerable educators for the tremendous work they have done in ensuring continuity of course delivery in the midst of the pandemic. I'm calling on city colleges to welcome the voices of adjuncts into the decision-making process about how the remaining millions of dollars in federal emergency aid can be used to serve our students. I'm calling on city colleges to drop 70% enrollment requirements that threaten our classes and our students to traditional enrollment thresholds. And city colleges must join other colleges in Chicago who have pledged not to contest unemployment claims for those point. who lose work during the pandemic. One of the many lessons to take from the current crisis is that we all live far more interconnectedly than we typically recognize. Adjuncts are an invaluable part of this institution. For your remarks, and city Mr. Colleges. Miller. Yep. Um. Our next speaker is Sonia Flores. Hello. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sonia Flores, and I'm here to represent the adult education program. Today is about equality and access for the adult education students and teachers. Our campuses are right in the middle of the heaviest hit with the coronavirus, having the highest mortality and infect members. Our union represents teachers who provide direct services to communities under the constant social economical distress in the primary black neighborhoods, brown and immigrant areas. Adult educators are essential workers to our students who are essential workers for Chicago. Between classes, they feed Chicago, clean Chicago and mass produce. After working our between jobs, or fighting the COVID-19, they join our classes remotely and share the following stories with the teachers. Teacher, my family is sick with COVID and my family of five is at home with no food and quarantine. Teacher, my parents passed away one week apart. Teacher, I am working in El Milagro Tortilla Factory closed for two weeks. Day in, out, we are teaching and holding our students together we are the pillar of our community, yet our union leaders and teachers are subject to listen to statements as, it is not your business what administrators are doing. They're, this saying for our teachers, our students is obvious. No equality, no communication, no transparency, no accountability. Chancellor, I humbly ask you to dig deep within your you and your better administration. Stretch the tortilla. Train your representatives to work collectively, not against us or the students. We insist this is a crisis that this board of trustees demands more collaboration marks to with close. union leaders for the sake of our students. We ask for the CC community resource needed to students and Thank you for your remarks, Ms. Flores. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Taylor. Uh, uh, Kimberly Taylor. Ms. Taylor, please mute your computer audio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Taylor, can you hear us? Ms. Taylor, please. Yes, hello. Uh, Ms. Taylor, please mute your computer. Ms. Taylor, yes. you're live on the board meeting. Please proceed with your remarks. I can hear you. Yes, hello. Hi, Ms. Taylor, you may begin. There is a- Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Kimberly Taylor. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for responding. I'm watching the live stream and listening on the phone and they're not in sync. So it's a little confusing, but thank you for having me today. My name is Kimberly Taylor. I'm an adult educator at Truman College. And my topic today uh, deals with launching opportunities for GED students at Truman and to create uh, access to transitional pathways for GED students and also hiring and retaining African-American um, managers, instructors, and office workers uh, in adult ed. Here are the facts. No workforce pathway exists for GED students at Truman. To date, the GED population at Truman has no transitional services, no exposure to career pathways, nor a workforce curriculum. Our GED students are not pursued by the transition specialist in adult education to join the Gateway Program. And I'm here today to bring this problem to your attention and to make an appeal to leadership at city colleges to do better. 
The organizational analysis at Truman College, currently there are only two adult ed African-American instructors, and I'm one of them. In other words, out of approximately 120 adult educators, only two of us are African-American. During my tenure, tenure, there has not been, there's only been one African-American manager. However, no African-American transition specialist, only one African-American coordinator, and that person left to go to another college for a manager opportunity. There was one instructor and one office worker forced out by manager and only three office workers that quit. That's six people gone in my tenure, uh, tenure here. If you are truly listening, you know that this is shameful. Hiring practices at Truman should reflect the diversity of the community that we serve today, but it does not. Ms. Ironically Ms. today Ms. on the news, to I will, thank you. Ironically on the news today, I heard that Chance the Rapper of Chicago is simultaneously raising this same issue with CPS. Ms. Taylor, to, thank you for your remarks. Um, so thank you to all our public speakers. Chair Massey, that concludes this month's public participation. Thank you and thanks to our public speakers. Next, we will hear from uh, Professor Keith Spruill with the uh, Faculty Council Report. Professor Spruill, please join us and proceed. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can and see you. So I'm, I'm in my regalia. Uh, we can't be at graduation this semester, but I've got it. I've got my mortarboard next to me. It's a really hideous shade of gray, but here it is and my uh, academic hood. So, you know, before I start, congratulations to the class of 2020 across our city and our country. It's been a real feat, particularly completing in this time in which students have had to do so much uh, to transition their learning online. So congratulations to the class of 2020. Chairman Massey, Board of Trustees, Chancellor Salgado, Provost Potter, officers of the district, faculty, staff, and all other streaming, good afternoon. My name is Keith Spruer. I have been English faculty at Harry S. Truman College for the past 10 years, where I primarily work with developmental students. I'm also the newly elected president of the Faculty Council of the City Colleges of Chicago for the 2020-2021 academic year. I take the role of servant leader seriously and I'm committed to bringing the collective voice of faculty to spaces in the spirit of shared governance. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Professor Adriana Tapanaz Inyosa, my predecessor, for her commitment to faculty and her tireless work in this position. As we know, the end of her term was punctuated by the COVID pandemic, and she was instrumental in our colleges being as, in as good a condition as we are now. Her leadership during this time has been remarkable. Thank you, Professor Tapanaz Inyosa. There are new faculty council officers at many of our colleges. I'd like to congratulate them on their election and look forward to meeting some of them for the first time and continuing to work with everyone who will serve during this academic year. This has been a particularly trying time for all of us. Being away from our colleges and our students has been difficult to say the least. In January, no one would have imagined we'd be where we currently are and that the world would look as it does. Considering what has happened, I'm proud of how our colleges have, have responded. Within a week, we were able to convert face-to-face -face coursework to remote learning. Support centers built online structures to continue serving our students, and technology was provided for members of our community so that they could continue learning. This is incredible. And faculty, local administer administrators, and district leadership is to thank, uh, are to thank. While we have done great things, this pandemic has also exposed some opportunities for growth. Early in our transition to remote learning, the road was rough. Directives from our district office change daily, sometimes multiple times within the same day. Certainly agility is necessary in times like these, but clear and consistent communication was not a problem that began with this pandemic. One of the larger issues was that faculty would hear one thing from district in a faculty council meeting. Others would report hearing something different in a union meeting. Administrators would pass down directives that contradicted anything that was said to other groups. I imagine that some of this was due to the changing nature of this situation. However, we cannot operate like this, particularly in times like these. The planning for our summer course offerings is an example of how communication has faltered and miscommunication has, in some cases, unintentionally created contentious relationships between faculty and their respective college leadership. Faculty are still unsure as to how the 70% course usage threshold was reached 
or what concessions can be made. This is primarily an issue considering the average regular semester usage is 72% as Chancellor Salgado informed us. Dr. Potter has expressed that there is some flexibility in that, but the particulars are still unclear. And I imagine that until it is, this will still be a source of tension between faculty and their local administrations. What I'm seeing is that there is no existing structure in which district officers, college leadership, and faculty leadership are in the same space to hear the same message and have cross conversation. This sometimes leads to decisions that are made based on limited information. That also means that when other information is presented, it sometimes necessitates for decisions to be altered. The president's council, the vice president's and faculty council all serve at times in advisory roles, but we are never in communication with each other district wide. Either we have to create the opportunities for cross conversation between these groups, or we need a way of communicating information quickly and clearly to everyone. We have been in conversation with the provost and the chancellor, and we confront difficult conversations. So I'm confident that this can be reached. One of the communications that has concerned faculty has been around online coursework. In communications sent to faculty, a district long-term vision for online work has been mentioned, but to many that vision has been unclear. Many faculty are frightened by the idea that this long-term vision is to move our colleges to primarily offering online work, forsaking our face-to-face -face offerings. This is problematic for a number of reasons, namely accessibility for some of our most vulnerable students. My understanding of the, this vision is different. My understanding has been that the goal is to increasingly have each college own their own coursework. Dr. Potter in our April 29th faculty council meeting confirmed that this was more along the lines of what he envisioned. He is committed to creating a written document to clarify this and further flesh out the vision for all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. This is good news. We have been asking for what I call the democratization of online work for years. By democratization, I mean that colleges would have voice and ownership of their online offerings within a framework for accountability that could be collaboratively created with district administrators. There are other issues that the faculty council is in conversation with district officers about. Most of them are COVID related. The status of our sports programs and commitments to students is one of them. We were glad to hear that commitments that have been made will be honored. We would also like more clarity around our adult education program and their ability to run during these times. Recently, our federal government has chosen to exclude but we are pleased to see that the city colleges have chosen to include. As Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos has made students who are not Title V eligible, ineligible for care funds. Uh, through funds collected by the foundation, we have been able to support all of our students. We were doing this before the care funds were dispersed and Chancellor Salgado committed to continuing to aid our students quickly. This is commendable. The accountability that we have provided through our webpage that out We lost them, right? Um, uh, we did. Uh, let's see if he comes back in. Uh, but um, I, I don't know what happened there. Uh, uh, but uh, why don't we proceed? And if he comes back in, we can uh, we can uh, ask him to conclude his remarks. Okay, we will proceed then. If you can hear us, Keith, thank you for that report. And I'm looking forward. I think Tracy is trying to set up a meeting for the two of us to get to know each other. So there's no formal committee report today, and there will be no closed session. So I will ask Trustee Williams, however, to give a, a brief report on the activities of the City Colleges of Chicago Foundation. <clears throat> For those of you who may not be aware of this, although I did announce it at a previous board meeting, the chairman of the board, along with the chancellor, are uh, ex officio members of the foundation board. However, uh, I asked Trustee Williams, or the designate, to uh, be the board representative in my place on the foundation. He has been tending those meetings. So this will be his first report in that regard. Trustee Williams. Thank you, Chair Massey. Uh, trustee board colleagues, Chancellor Salgado, Provost Potter, City Colleges of Chicago, presidents and staff, I'm pleased to report on the recent 
City Colleges of Chicago Foundation Board of Directors meeting and overall progress. In response to COVID-19, the CCC slash CCCF team was invited to participate in a convening of private foundation officers and individual philanthropists regarding the CCC's emergency response and plans to support students through this crisis. Within six weeks, the foundation community responded with unprecedented support for our student community. And to date, we have secured either received or pledged a total of $2.2 million for COVID emergency, student emergency funds. COVID student emergency funds are designated into two areas, our student emergency fund, which is being dispersed by our partner, All Chicago, and the Chancellor's Retention Fund, which provides grants to students to support overall retention efforts of CCC students. We are very grateful to the community of foundations and individuals who have rallied behind city colleges in this unprecedented time. We decided to postpone our in-person seven strong benefit until 2021. However, our team will be working on a virtual event and we ask that you stay tuned. Finally, for the academic year 2019-2020, the foundation received over 7,000 scholarship applications compared to 2,270 for the 2018-2019 academic year. The systems we're developing are leading to incredible growth with fiscal year 20 fall spring awards totaling approximately $647,000 up from 201,000 the previous academic year. Chair Massey, this concludes my report. Thank you very much, Trustee Williams, and thank you for representing the trustees on the board. Where's uh, Professor Spruill, you got cut off right at the end. If you, why don't you finish up your remarks? I did, my computer decided to cut off on me. <laughs> so I'm rejoining you from my phone. Um, nope. I don't have very long to go, so. Uh, where I left off was commending us on the work that we've been doing to support students through the foundation and philanthropic uh, funds that we've gotten. So the accountability that uh, we have provided through our webpage that outlines COVID spending makes it clear that what we have been doing has been in the interest of our students. Also, it says something to our community about our ethic of care. It shows that we put our money where our mouth is and where our heart is. While we haven't received federal guidance around how the portion of the CARE funds may be used to cover COVID-related expenses, faculty would like to be included in conversations about the use of those funds. Finally, as we look forward to the fall semester, we realize that things are in flux. We learn new information about the virus every day. Many institutions have committed to making decisions about returning to campus in the next couple of weeks. It is our hope that we will do the same. I can't imagine any circumstance in which by fall, gathering in large numbers will be safe. We need to plan for that world and a clear decision on what courses will be offered remotely and which we could safely offer either face-to-face -face or in a hybrid format would be helpful for us to do that. Students need to make decisions and faculty need to prepare. We need clear decisions and messaging around faculty credentialing for online teaching and definitions of remote learning. We are working towards clarity on this with Dr. Potter and Chancellor Salgado. We are making great progress on many of these issues and others in collaboration with our district officers. We've been sitting down and really doing the work. It is my hope that we will continue to do that work and do it even better and daily renew our commitment to the success of our students. Again, congratulations to the class of 2020. Stay safe, stay at home. And this concludes my report. <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry about the interruption. So, thank <clears throat> you. Okay, so we will now proceed to review the items on the May 7th 2020 regular board meeting consent agenda. This month, all items for board action, except for the election uh, through the trustee, which we have already handled separately, are on the consent agenda, which was posted alongside the substantive details on the board website, consistent with our practice. The assistant board secretary will provide guidance to the presenters. Assistant Secretary Kang, please proceed 
with the review of the remaining board reports. Thank you, Chair Massey. Officers of the district, college presidents, and district staff, please prepare to provide your reports on the agenda items to the trustees. You should be prepared to join the video and the audio portions of the live stream now. Trustees, today's presenters are General Counsel Gowan, who will present Resolution 1.00. Chief Town Officer Dunning will review the personnel report. Chief of Staff Lugo will present the Resource Development Report. CFO Rodriguez will present Agreement 4.00, and President Sanders will present Agreements 4.01 and 4.02. General Counsel Gowan will conclude the review of agenda items by presenting the legal invoices. For our presenters, please proceed one after the other, briefly pausing to give the trustees an opportunity to ask any questions they have about the item being presented. And General Counsel, please proceed. Thank you. Resolution 1.00 requests that the board authorizes the chair to execute the memorandum of understanding between the board and the City Colleges of Chicago Foundation, substantially in the form presented to the board for review. This memorandum of understanding formalizes the relationship between the board and the City Colleges of Chicago Foundation. Are there any questions? Uh, Chief Town Officer Dunning. Good afternoon. Board item 2.0 is a request to approve the May 2020 personnel report. There are 30 actions on this month's report. They include seven new and rehires, 17 promotions, funding source, title, and salary changes, and six resignations, retirements, and separations. This concludes the report. Uh, there being no questions, Chief of Staff Lugo. Good afternoon. We have a short report this month that includes grant proposals funded and received in the amount of $75,000 and new proposals submitted in the amount of $146,500. If there are no questions, that will conclude this month's resource development report. Um, thank you. CFO Rodriguez. Good afternoon, everyone. Agreement 4.00, this is a request to approve an agreement with TouchNet Information Systems to utilize their payment gateway services to allow students to pay their tuition fees online via credit card or ACH payments through the CCC web portal. The term of this agreement is from June 1, 2020 through May 31, 2021 at a total cost not to exceed $68,145. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, provided there are no questions, President Sanders, uh, uh, please proceed with agreements 4.01 and 4.02. Sure. <clears throat> Board report <clears throat> 4.01 is a request for authorization to execute an agreement with LinkedIn Learning subscription services for students participating in the Workforce Equity Initiative at Malcolm X College, Olive Harvey College, and Kitty King College for the period from May 31st, 2020 through May 30th, 2021 at a total cost not to exceed $48,850. LinkedIn will provide up to 495 students one-year subscriptions to a web-based learning library called LinkedIn Learning to develop career readiness skills. This service will also allow city colleges the ability to track job placement of graduates, all while allowing the students access to the web-based platform from multiple locations. The funding for this initiative originates from the Workforce Equity Initiative grant, where all funds must be spent by June 2021. Okay, if there are no questions, I'll go to uh, board report 4.02. Um, this is where we're requesting authorization uh, to uh, execute an agreement with Assessment Technologies Institute to provide remote proctoring services for the students in the associate degree nursing program and the practical nursing advanced certificate program for the period from April 15th, 2020 through May 9th, 2020 at a total cost not to exceed 3,525. Uh, this is in addition to the already authorized um, uh, authorization that we have for um, ATI. Um, and that is the end of my report. Thank you, President Sanders. If there are no questions, uh, General Counsel Gowan with the legal invoices. Thank you. 
Item 6.00 requests approval of legal invoices totaling $112,827.43. Such invoices cover labor, litigation, employment, higher ed, and corporate matters. Thank you, General Counsel. Uh, Chair Massey, there being no other questions, this concludes the presentation of board reports. And thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Kang, and thank all of our presenters as well. So trustees, uh, we will now prepare for the final action. I assume everyone on mute. So does anyone have questions or comments on any of the items listed that were just described or would any trustee like to request separate action on any item? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the resolutions, the personnel report, the research development report, the agreements and the legal invoices contained in the consent agenda and identified as part of the printed agenda on a single roll call vote. And I have a motion, please. So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and second. Assistant Secretary Kane. Mr. Swanson. Approved. Secretary Davis. Approved. Trustee Kent. Approved. Trustee Tellman. Approved. Trustee Williams. Approved. Student Trustee Thomas. Approved. Chair Massey. Approved. So thank you all. Let the records show that the resolutions, the personnel report, the resource development report, agreements and legal invoices included on the May 7th, 2020 consent agenda have all been approved. Well, so thank you for joining us today. We will provide updates on our website, uh, www.ccc.edu, as they relate to our next meetings or any changes to our existing plans. So there being no further business to come before the board, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second. Second. Yeah. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, colleagues. And Thank you, colleagues. Stay safe. Thank you. Nice to see Thank everyone. You. All right.